Hello and welcome to the Phuket Stories Podcast. I'm your moderator, Saigon Steve. On this recorded podcast, we'll talk with service alumni who were stationed at Phuket Air Force Base in Vietnam and talk with them about their experiences. Today's podcast is pre-recorded, but you're invited to participate on future podcasts by emailing your contact information to phuketstories at gmail.com. That's phuketstories at gmail.com. So let's get started with today's Phuket guest. We're talking today with Kelly Chamberlain, who lives in Clearwater, Florida. Kelly was at Phuket Air Force Base in Vietnam. Hi, Kelly. Hi, how are you doing? Okay. So tell us, when did you join the Air Force? Uh, I joined the Air Force uh, September 29th of 1965. And I assume you went to Lackland Air Force Base, right? Yeah, I did. Famous Lackland. I'll bet you remember your T.I.'s name, right? Yeah. Sergeant Medina. He was a mean SOB. He didn't <laughs> like me at all. He called me sleepy because I learned uh, it was in about Lackland. All you did was uh, march in, in, in formation. And I learned how to uh, lock my knees and close my eyes and try to get some sleep. And he caught me several times. <laughs> It didn't go over too well. We learned how to catch a nap at attention, but not at parade breast. Yeah, that's right. But I survived that. I got out of Lackland. I put in for Travis Air Force Base. They sent me to Westover Air Force Base, Massachusetts. And I thought, well, that's typical. Uh, the reason I went in the Air Force was I... I saw buddies uh, in the classes ahead of me coming home missing toes, arms, you name it. And they'd joined the Army, and I figured, well, there's no way in hell I'm going to join the Army. So I joined the Air Force. I figured that'd be the safest route. I went to Westover Air Force Base uh, on OJT. Learn on the job. And your job was? Security police. I thought I was going to be a cop, but I thought learned real quick there's a big distinction between a cop in the air force and security it's a huge difference explain if you're that's fine you you stand in the main gate you direct traffic all kinds of stuff like normal police if you're in security you uh go out on a ramp freeze your freeze your butt off and uh roast to death in the daytime freeze at night and you just sit there and you watch the airplane. That's it. <laughs> you don't do anything else. So I learned real hard. I got what they call tail guard, my first assignment. And that was to hump behind uh, KC-135 on alert. You'd hump back and forth behind four planes, and you were always, uh, they had a nose guard. And if the nose guard had trouble, you had to go up and assist him. Very rare did I ever have an issue, except before I left, they had a, on a P-52, they had a crew, thought they'd play games with a nose guard. I was uh, humping, humping the ramp in the back. The uh, crew had an alert. They came flying up, and they had to jump, uh, break through a uh, snowbank to get to their aircraft, and they jumped out, and they ran towards their aircraft get in and those guards have to check all their uh, badges and IDs to make sure they're, they're proper well I happened to look up and I saw him yelling and he had a guy by the shirt and he had his 38 out and he was uh, trying to get the guy on the ground and all the others were standing around watching so I came charging up then the guys start saw me, and they tried to get in the aircraft, and I screamed out, freeze. And they thought I was kidding, because I was quite the sight. 
I made them all get on the ground, and they were, they were laughing. And I slapped around in the chamber. Of course, you're not supposed to do that, but I did it anyway. And they realized I was serious, so they all got on the ground, and I started yelling the code for an issue. Next thing I know, they had security alert teams all over the place. The guy that uh, the nose guard had, I called him the little sheriff. He was a little guy. What they did was one of the flight crew decided to change his picture and drew over it like Mickey Mouse. And uh, he actually wrote on it, Mickey Mouse. And that's what alerted the, <laughs> the nose guard. Well, needless to say, commanders all came out. The entire crew was uh, disciplined. I don't know what they did to them. But that was the only event I really had at Westover. Then uh, I got in trouble. I was always in trouble. I won't get into how, what kind of trouble. Anyway, I happened to know a sergeant, and he knew I was in real serious trouble. And for whatever reason, he liked me. His name was Sergeant Louis Doucette. He said, look, you got to get out of here, because I'd been restricted to base. I was non-transferable, non-promotable. And he said, I can get you out of here. I said, really? He goes, yeah. He said, do you care where you go? I said, no, if I can get out of here, I'll take it. Because otherwise, I was looking at Leavenworth. That was my next duty station. And, uh, as an inmate or as a, or as a security police officer? I would have been a, as an inmate. I was looking at, ten, well, minimum five years. What had happened was I pulled a starter's pistol on a couple of guys who were harassing me and my buddy. I told them, I said, pull up next to them. So I pulled up. Every time we went up there, they'd roll the windows up and lock it, lock it down. So I said, pull up. And he said, we can't take on that many guys. I said, no, I'm not worried. So I leaned out of the car as we drove up, and I emptied the starter pistol. They all started screaming and crying. I hid the weapon. I wouldn't, I wouldn't give it up. And without, I knew without that they didn't have a case. And the captain talked me into uh, turn it into him. I asked him to put it in writing. He said, you're about a hair's breadth away from going. I'm going to Leavenworth. He said, don't take advantage of him. I said, okay. So I gave it to him, and they dropped all the charges. But they were out to get me anyway for that. So anyway, long story short, Sergeant Doucette uh, told me, he said, I'll pick you up at midnight. And he said, I can get you out of here. I said, okay, fine. I said, can I bring a buddy? And he goes, sure. Who do you want to bring? And I told him. I'd been through basic with a guy named uh, Kevin Forrester. I asked him, I said, you want to go? He says, hell yeah, we'll go together. I said, okay, wherever we're going. He said, I don't care. I said, all right. So we went down, and this uh, guy in personnel that was friends with Sergeant Doucette had all, all of our paperwork set up on the table. And I looked at mine, and it said, next duty station, it said Vietnam. And I went, oh, wow. It's the only way? He goes, that's it. I said, oh, wow. So I signed it, and so did Kevin and Louie. And that was how we ended up in Vietnam. Kevin and I went to uh, Saigon. Never did see Louie Doucette after that. And we got to, well, Tan Sanuk. They took us and sent me and him out to uh, a small hut. Seriously, it was like a grass hut out in the middle of nowhere. God, it was blazing hot, no air conditioning, and I was in my winter blues. So I was roasting to death, but I didn't have anything else. And they told us, you stay here, and we'll notify you when we're going to have you move out. I said, okay, fine. Well, little did I know, that was the uh, worst place on the base. Like I said, no air conditioning. You only had one window and one door, and the place just stunk. I mean, I couldn't figure out what the smell was. It was just awful. So we, me and Kevin walked around. We went up to the main gate. We asked the uh, AP up there, gate guard, if we could go into town. He said, not without papers, and dressed like that, no way. He said, don't shoot your ass as soon as you get out the gate. I said, Really? He goes, oh, yeah, hell, you don't want to go down there dressed like that. I said, well, we would just
just want to get out of here. I think we were stuck there for a week. So anyway, he said he wouldn't let us go. So anyway, we were walking back to our hut, and uh, God, the, the closer I got, the more it stink. And I think it had to be 110, 112 degrees. And I was just roasting in my blues. Finally, I saw this guy. I said, what the hell is that god-awful stench? He goes, oh, you see that gutter? And I said, yeah. He said, you see what's in it? I said, yeah, looks like muddy water. No, he said, that's blood. That hut up there where they, there was a building up there, a complex. And he said, they, they drain the bodies where they ship them home. I said, what's that, blood? Yeah. I said, oh, my God. Well, I back to, the, to our little hut, and I followed that gutter. It went right behind our hut where we had the one open window. And I swear I was going to gag every time I took a breath after that. And then the next day they came by and told us to load up. They had a place for us to go. I got I couldn't get out of there fast enough. So I went up the flight line. There was a bunch of us. They loaded us up on a C-130. There was a bunch of us. Uh, I think about six, well, maybe 70 guys. And we jumped on the flight. We didn't know where we were going. We landed. We ended up, we landed in uh, Quignan. And... Nobody knew what to do. They started calling off the ranks. Of course, I was a low man on the pole. Only had one stride. I didn't even bother yelling out my name. Finally, they narrowed it down. There was a staff sergeant. He was in charge. I think his name was Peckinpah, as I recall. He uh, asked for uh, who was the scrounger and we, what we needed, and the guy took off. He said, you go get what you can. Next thing I know, they brought a, uh, I guess you call it a half ton, filled with uh, sea rash. They dumped it all out on the ground. Everybody fended for themselves and grabbed whatever they could. We had no place to sleep. They didn't give us a barracks. They gave us a truck, a big half ton truck. Most of the guys slept in the back or on the ground. I jumped in the front thinking, oh, I'll have a nice cushy place. But what a mistake that was. I sat on the window in the passenger seat, and I swear, I'd never been eaten alive by bugs before until that night. The only thing I, I learned is the more if you light up a cigarette and you keep blowing smoke, it fends them off. It keeps them off of you. So I, I found all the cigarettes I could, and I smoked them all up that night, just trying to keep the bugs off of me. And I don't think I slept a wink. But my buddy Kevin, he slept. And laid on me most of the night. I was hanging out the window trying to get some air. I still had my winter blues on. Next morning, they loaded us up on uh, old school buses. I asked where we were going, and the guy said, we're going up to a place about 20 miles inland called Fukat. We get on a bus, and it had no windows, and they had uh, chicken wire all over the inside of the bus on the windows where the windows should have been. And I asked, I yelled out, why they got all this chicken wire on the on the windows? They said, that way, if you see throw a grenade, it'll bounce off. He said, but they learned how to fix that. I said, well, what do you mean? Now they throw it, they wrap them in uh, fishing lines with hooks. So if they throw it at the chicken wire, it'll get hung up on the chicken wire and kill us anyway. So that's good to know. If we're going down the road, all these little kids and people are throwing rocks at us. They're spitting on a bus. I'm going, and these are the people we're here to protect? What the hell? They don't want us here. Guys started yelling, turn around, let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> it was a hot, bouncy ride. I mean, ruts. It's not even really a road. It was just dirt. We got up, and they made a turn. They had a sign uh, drawn out on a cardboard, flattened out cardboard, and said Phuket with an arrow point that way. I looked up and the road was just horrible, if you want to call it a road. So anyway, we got up there and they told us to unload, and we did. The guys that told us to get off were 1041st, safe side, and there was like, uh, I want to say, a lot of NCOs and a lot of strikes. 
and they took us up to a area. They told us first thing was whatever they taught you in five day quickie course on how to die in Vietnam. That was the Air Force equivalents of combat preparedness. By the way, what year was it that you came to Phuket? It was April 1967. So it was still pretty primitive there at Phuket in 67. Oh, yeah. There wasn't anything there. When we got there, though, safe 1041st was uh, in tent, and uh, I didn't see any place for us to go to lay down or sleep except on the grass. I saw no buildings except one. They hadn't even, they just, I think they put the last nail in it as we pulled up. It was an open bay. They had a truck come up. They had all these cots in it. We all had to grab a cot, and they said, spread them out three feet apart. So we did. And they said, uh, whatever one you just laid out, that's yours. Night, night. <laughs> there was no electricity, you know, nothing. And they had an outhouse out behind it. That was it. That was our first night. Next day, some NCOs showed up. And uh, this one guy, his name was Sergeant Kelch. He was a tech. He, he was the epitome of, uh, don't piss me off or I'm going to kill you. And he would. He said, who's the lowest ranking man in here? So I had to sheepishly raise my hand. He said, come with me. I said, okay. I was still in my uniform, my winter blues. He took me out. He handed me a forty-five and a web belt. He said, you know what this is? Well, I know what it is. He said, you ever fired one? I said, no. Well, okay. I'll give you a quick course. Here's the safety. Here's the clip. Put the clip in. Jack around in it. You're good to go. Can you aim it and shoot it? I said, that's it, Yeah. <laughs> So I went with him. I had the first first night guard duty. I had to go out. I had to walk between uh, a line of jungle and uh, tents that the uh, pilots were housed in. And they were out on the flight line. And there was an area probably six to eight feet wide that I had to patrol behind to protect the pilots. And I'm I remember thinking, what the hell am I going to do out here? If they jump me, all I can do is scream, and then it dawned on me. That's all I'm going to be. I'll be be the last voice (laughs) that I hear screaming for my life. They'll wake up, and they can get the hell out. I mean, I wouldn't even have time to draw my weapon. So I stayed there all night, and (laughs) the last last word Sergeant Kelt said to me, he always had this, He'd roll his eyes, I swear to God. His eyes would roll into the back of his head, and he got this nervous twitch, and he mumbled to me, I wish I had a nickel for every back I broke. I said, of who? People will fall asleep on my post, my watch. I said, oh, Christ, I won't do that. <laughs> he scared the bejesus out of me. He came by next morning, picked me up. He said, good job. You didn't fall asleep, but I didn't have to break your back. I said, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't think of that. Next time I had guard duty was out on a flight line, and I'd never seen C-7As, or I called them Goonie Birds, landing and taking off. And when I saw them, they were like, really, that's why we called them Goonie Birds. It was like watching a duck take flight. I was out at the end of the runway. When I say it was a runway, they didn't have a real runway. They had, uh, I, can't, I can't remember what they call it. It was a grate. It was all linked together. It was like chain. And they'd roll it up, and they'd call it out the runway. And underneath it was just red dirt. And every time a goonie bird would take off, I mean, they left a cloud of dirt. It was like, oh, my God, can you see? I couldn't see when they'd take off. I was blinded by the dust. I happen to be at the end of the runway when one's coming in to land. And I swear to God, I, I looked up and he, he was coming straight in. And I went, oh, my God, the plane's going to crash. So I started running. <laughs> I was still in my winter blues. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to die. And I started running. Had to grab my hat off my head. And I'm, I was 
tear ass and run it. And I was a fast runner. And I still had a 45 on. He flattened that thing out just right at the last second and came floating in like it was nothing. I'm sure they were laughing their ass off at me. I thought I was going to die. But I learned that's how they, that's how a gurney bird uh, comes in for a landing. It's like a controlled crash. They were working feverishly to put up our barracks, and they got them built. Red horse, that is. And they were, they were, they did a hell of a job. They got uh, the barracks up for uh, security police squadron. Red horse was the unsung heroes of Phuket. They were our augmentees, which meant they had to go out. They had bunkers. Their bunkers were only like three foot high circle of sandbags, and they had to hide in there. I mean, if you drop a mortar in there, it'd kill them all. When I went out on post my first night, I was what I call a, uh, well, it was guard, guard tower duty. I mean, you're just out there to scream as loud as you can if, if, if you can get a breath out to warn everybody. So they hadn't built and, Tango 13 yet? I don't know where Tango 13 is. I keep hearing people talk about it. They say it was up near the bomb dump. Oh, my God, that was a horrible place. Yeah, I'd done duty up there, and I figured I got that I got that tower one night, and I went, if they mortar this bobbed up, I'll see the, I'll see a bright flash, and that's it. <laughs> that was Tango 13, huh? I believe so. Scary. When I went there, it was a tower probably made out of wood, probably 20 feet up. So what you do is you had a rope hanging down, you rope all your stuff up. It took you a while to get your M60 up there and all that other gear and ammo. And uh, you'd make maybe three rope rope poles with, to get it all up there. And you have to climb up the ladder, untie it, run back down, tie it up. You do that three times. So it took you a while to get situated. And then you sit up there and roast your ass off all day or at night you sit there and keep your eyes you look like bug eyes <laughs> looking around you always worried that Charlie would sneak sneak up and cut your throat and if that wasn't good enough you had to worry about the pythons pythons were all over the place they were terrible and every time you hear uh, something under your tower and you hear like a fight hissing growling you'd always go yeah mongoose got that one <laughs> I remember one time I had bunker duty out on uh, the south south gate. It was dug into the ground, into into a hill. We called it Bunker 30. It had a tin roof on it, which daytime just awful inside, but still you were out of the sun. It was like an oven. And uh, I had swing shift, and I went out there, and we pulled up. And I threw all my gear off the flatbed. And I saw the guy sit, sitting up on a roof. I thought, well, what the hell? What are you sitting up on a roof for? As I'm walking down the stairs to go into it, he said, no, there's a king cobra in there. Oh, I did an about face, and I said, seriously? He goes, yep. Came in there about 2 o'clock this afternoon, and I ain't been down there since. Uh, so I laid up on a roof till the sun went down. At least I boiled my ass off. And I had my M60 up there. I was getting getting scared that the heat would explode by set my ammo off. But there was no way I was going in there. I thought about throwing a grenade in there. Then I'd blow up the whole damn thing. That wouldn't be any good. I'll tell you what, that was the longest, hottest part of the day. And I let that snake have a home. <laughs> and the guy came out to relieve me at midnight. He said, what are you doing up on a rope? I said, there's a king cobra in there. I've been up here all night. <laughs> he goes, uh, I guess I'll be up on the roof all night, too. I said, yeah, I wouldn't go in there. <laughs> so, <laughs> those, are, those are fun times. I was out on, uh, up on a tower. I don't know, I can't remember the name of the one I was up in, but it was dark. You couldn't see a hand in front of your face. And it was my birthday, October 15th. And I kept telling guys before I went out, 
not a good day to go, what's the matter? I said, oh, it's my birthday, and I'm going to die on my birthday. I just know it. <laughs> well, I guess word got around. I was sitting up in a tower, and I was sitting there, and I, whenever you lit up a cigarette, you threw your poncho over your head. You know, you, you wouldn't sit, stick your head up smoking a lighted cigarette. They could see that a mile away. So I figured, well, I'm not going to do it. So every time I took a puff, I bent my head down underneath so nobody could see me. Then all of a sudden I heard this. You died tonight, G.I. <laughs> Sat up on my, set my hair on standing on end. And I'm peeking out over the ridge of my tower. And I shifted my M60 around. And yeah, tonight you die. I, I went on for about a half an hour. And I could hear him moving around out there. So I figured where he might be. So I took and tore off a clip of uh, M60 rounds, and I stuck it in there. <laughs> tore, all the, tore all the tracer rounds out, and I cut loose with about maybe eight rounds. And heard this, you son of a bitch, you almost killed my dog. <laughs> it was canine. <laughs> I said, well, you bastard, what are you doing? <laughs> he goes, I'm coming in. I ought to shoot your ass. I said, you almost killed me and my dog. I said, I was just messing with you. I said, well, I'm in no mood to mess around. So did you ever come in contact with the enemy? I'll tell you, one time we had a, we were out going out to a place called Hawaii. It was a tower that uh, had, uh, uh, what do you call it, ground sensors all up and down the fence line. And there was a tower the guy in the tower monitored them. And you, it could distinguish between a human and, a, and an animal. So anyway, we, we were out there riding around, and Osborne said, thought he saw something off to the side. I said, oh, come on, Osborne, we're just going to go up to Hawaii. No, no, he says, I saw something. So he drove the Jeep over there. We all deployed. We're walking around. And I had the M60. And sure enough, he spotted somebody. We ducked down. We, we, it was, whoever it was had their back to us. They didn't see it. We're deployed on this, uh, uh, well, in this old dried up rice paddy. And I saw Osborne taking off his web belt and he pulled out his bayonet. I said, what are you doing? He said, just stay here. Wait. Before I knew it, he was up and running. I went, oh, my God. He had that, he was going to cut this guy, guy's throat. So I looked at the new guy that was with me, and he, I think he'd only been in country a month. I said, follow me. So he took off running. I pulled out my thirty-eight. I was going to fire a warning shot so that if it was an enemy, he'd turn around, and then by that time, Ozzy would be on him. I didn't fire my 38 for whatever reason. I don't know. I hold it up in the air, and I, I started to squeeze, but it didn't go off. When we finally got to him, Ozzy had him on the ground, and they were tussling. And I looked at my 38, and when I'd gone to get up, I'd used my 38 to push myself up, up on the ground. And it was a mud hole, and it plugged up my 38. If I'd have fired that, it would have blown my hand off. <laughs> he rolled over to the Supposed VC, and it was a old mama son. <laughs> ripped, her, ripped her hat off. <laughs> She's going, no big, no big, no big. <laughs> I started laughing. <laughs> said, Damn, I thought it was a VC. Okay, sure, Ozzy. Go around beating up old ladies. She didn't say you're number one GI. <laughs> yeah, well, I probably did in, the, in all the screaming she was doing. No, I think she said she called him number 10. You hucking number 10. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kelly, life. your your Fouquet experience was a lot different from my Fouquet experience. Everybody kept trying to bug me, tell me, go on, go on, Cobra. I said, no, you got to go out there on ambush and all that. I don't need snakes crawling around up my ass. I can't handle the bugs out of this. You want me to go out there and lay around with a killer snakes? No, nah, I don't think so. They had a thing called uh, bamboo vipers. I mean, those were deadly. 
they just break your skin. You got about six seconds to live. That's how poisonous they were. I was out on a ground bunker. I would say on the left side of the runway at the end. And uh, it was just a small bunker, I mean. So anyway, I was out there. It was a uh, midnight shift. And I was all set up. I had all my cigarettes lined up to keep the bugs at bay. I was up to five packs a day. I pull them all. Non-filtered. Trying to keep the bugs at bay. Anyway, he called me up and said, uh, be aware there's an aircraft that's going to be uh, dumping fuel on over your position. Uh, well, my immediate thought is, when you get that call, <laughs> fuel, plane dumping fuel, that means he's going to crash. So he's dumping all his fuel. Something I what the hell? And then the SAT team came out, and they told me the same thing. I said, what the hell? Is he going to crash? And they took off and left me. He said, we'll be, we'll be back to check on that. I said, what the crap? So I went back down into my bunker. I figured, well, I'm going to eat. So I started eating. Then I heard a plane buzzing over me, and I thought, what the hell? He's kind of early. I've been around JP4, and I didn't think much of it. So I kept, I kept eating my sea rats. I'm trying to remember what I was eating, probably scrambled eggs and chopped ham, because I learned how to eat that stuff and enjoy it. You just pour all the salt and pepper on it, and if you can, heat it up on the manifold. If you know the guy, if you know the sat leader, he'll let you do it. So anyway, I was sitting there eating, and I kept hearing, the guy was buzzing really low, and I'm thinking, what the hell? And I felt this stuff on my arms, and I thought, and it was kind of sticky. I thought, that's not friggin' JP4, what the hell? So I stuck my head out, and I looked up, tried to see, I couldn't see, sprayed all over my head. Sat team came by, said, guy's come and gone, huh? I said, no, what the hell was that? What do you mean, what the hell was that? I wasn't JP4. He wasn't dumping fuel. What did he dump? He said, oh, something to kill the growth. I said, well, it hurt me. Nah, don't worry about it. And <laughs> drove off. I thought, what the hell? Uh, that's when I got it. Sure enough, I got skin cancer. I got all kinds of stuff. What a story. What a story. And your your career in the military, you were out there in the, in, in the war, engaging with the enemy, and then you had to... In- being exposed to Agent Orange. You've earned your stripes there, uh, Sergeant Chamberlain. Yeah. Tell you what, there were uh, 13 of us. We're getting ready to leave our last duty day. We were all terrified of our last duty night. So we all as a group got together and said, look, if we're going to go, let's all go together. Because we came here and we've lasted this long. So if if we're going to die, let's all die together. So we did. Went up and approached the flight sergeant and asked him for our last duty night to uh, go out on an ambush. And we thought, yeah, they won't won't let us do that. Well, they did. They came back and said, sure, where are you going to go do the ambush? So we thought hard hard on it. And we wanted to go just, uh, I guess you call it north north of uh, the rock camp, they were down on the river, and we wanted to set up just north of that on the river. That was between the road and uh, the rock camp. So we did. We all piled into a jeep. (laughs) We had to hang on. I went out armed to the teeth. I took a shotgun, an M16 with my grenade launcher. I had a grenade launcher on my 16, but... uh, Loaded up with uh, 38, let's see, I had a shotgun 38 bandoleros for the M60 because there were five guys with five M60s. I went out with grenades stuffed in almost every pocket, 16 ammo, and I made banana clips out of them. I could barely walk. <laughs> I could barely get on the Jeep. And then I pretty much, <laughs> my knees buckled under the weight. <laughs> Every time I took a step. But we got out, and I got set up, and uh, I thought it was a good position. Uh, there was a route that shot out around uh, the river, and it was a nice nice spot to sit. So I lined up my uh, grenade launcher grenades in front of me, 
and I took a bunch of ammo and lined it up next to me and had my 60 built because I had a guy next to me. His name was Martinez, and uh, he had an M60. We all spread out. What I did when I worked, when I was out there, you learn to listen to the flow of the river, and uh, you get the rhythm down or anything that inter- intercepts or interrupts that flow, you know something's going on. So about 3 o'clock in the morning, all of a sudden I heard the flow change. It was different. So I perked my ear up, and I you couldn't really see. And sure enough, I heard I heard a canteen bang, and I went, son of a bitch, there's somebody out there in the river. Well, then we heard more. So I took my 16, and I leveled it, and I loaded up a, a grenade in the launcher. And I figured, I'm going to squeeze off some rounds, and I'm going to pop the grenade in the direction I figured it was at. So I reached over, and I grabbed Marty's arm, and I whispered as quiet as I could, tell Charlie. Charlie Comfer was our team leader, and he was right on the other side of Martinez. Tell him I'm going to open up. And so he did. And then he came back and he took my hand and he put it on his forehead and he shook it back and forth. Charlie said, don't fire. So what? And there's still more guys crossing. I was like, oh, I was incensed. Now we're in serious trouble. If I open up now, they'll sur- they could get it behind us. I figured the, the rocks have an M50 caliber behind us or on the other side of us. They'll open up when they hear the shoot. Charlie said no. So we listened, and I'll tell you what, there was a lot of them. It went on for a good half an hour before finally there was silence. Well, we got out of there, and I, I lost control. I screamed at Charlie walking out. You name it, I called him. And he said, no, there were too many of them. I said, my ass, you gutless son of a bitch. So we got out. We were cleaning our weapons, and somebody yelled out, thank God we're, we're done. We're going home. I thought, oh, yeah, that's right. So our sergeant came over, and he goes, what happened out there? So Charlie explained it because he's the team leader. He said he, he felt there were just too many of them to, for us to take on. I started in my spiel, and he asked me, what did I think? And I said, well, he was the team leader. I guess I got to go with it. And I said, I don't agree with him. So anyway, he said, uh, it's good you did. And he looked at Charlie. He said, you got to thank Charlie. I said, why? There was 300 of them. The Army had been tracking them, and they cut right in front of your ambush. I said, 300? He goes, yeah. VC? No, NVA. So, crap. So if we'd opened up, we'd all been on the wall. There were only 13 of us. I don't care how much armor we had. wasn't enough. Not for no 300. So we all flew home. We went down to Cameron Bay. I'll tell you what, I know what alcohol poisoning is. <laughs> well, Kelly Chamberlain, this has been one heck of an interview. I believe everybody that's listening to this thing is going to say, you were extraordinary. I was lucky in the guys that I was with. We were all lucky. Kelly Chamberlain, thank you for your service. Well, thank you. And I thank you, too. Welcome home. Well, that wraps up another episode of Phuket Stories. If you'd like to participate in a future Phuket Stories podcast, email your contact information to phuketstories at gmail.com. That's phuketstories at gmail.com. Until next time, thanks for listening to the Phuket Stories podcast. I'm Saigon Steve. <laughs>